just to reiterate what Mike was saying, if we, we've had an opportunity to just get a glimpse of the report that Ginger and Mike put out. It's an incredible report, the depth of it, the time. Um, it's worth everybody reading every single page of that report. It's really terrific. Great job, Ginger and Mike. Just quickly, let me introduce the panel. Um, to my left right here is David Godlewski. He's the president of the Southern Arizona Home Builders. Amy McReynolds is the division president of KB Homes. Jeff Grobstreen is the regional president of Meritage Homes. Julie Mastriani is the president of Miramonte Homes. And Bob Bambauer obviously is intimidated by all these presidents. <laughs> but he is the senior vice president of Sunbelt Holdings. Welcome and thanks for taking your all's time. We really appreciate it. You know, just to initiate the conversation, I, I thought maybe a little historical perspective from the home builders. Um, Amy, Jeff, and Julie, if you could just kind of give us a, um, tell us where you were in the height of the market okay. in terms of your sales volume or number of sales, where you were at the low point, and currently where you are now and where you think you'll be next year. You want to go, Julie? Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, hi. Um, we, if, if it's okay, I'd like to give a brief history because we have a, an interesting story. Um, I've been with Miramonte Homes for 20 years, and I was 10 when I started. Uh, um, but we, had, uh, we have had an interesting history because we've been private and public and private. So we've had a, a glimpse inside the world of, of the public home builder. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity for us. Uh, we were a division of Standard Pacific Home for about four years, and um, it afforded us a lot of learning experience, and um, it's very interesting to live inside your competition's world and, and go back to being private. Uh, we have a great deal of respect for what they do. We've always um, had a great deal of respect for our competition, and I think that's um, one of the reasons we made it through the Great Recession. Um, uh, of the past 12 years. Um, at the height, we had about 350 sales, 265 closings. Um, as a private home builder, that was um, a challenge for us uh, on a lot of levels. In, uh, at, the, at the lowest point, um, we had uh, 68 sales and 77 closings. It's kind of a telling story. I, I don't even want to talk about the changes in employment and the reduction in force that we went through, which was incredibly painful. Um, but there is a definite human factor to that number, and I want to make sure I bring that up. Um, this year, we're looking at <clears throat> 98 sales, 100 sales, and a little over 100 closings. Next year, we are anticipating about 150 sales, 120 to 130 closings. But I need to digress very quickly. Um, we are not solely a Tucson home builder anymore. Um, our heart is in Tucson. We will always have a corporate presence in Tucson. But for the reasons discussed earlier, um, we have branched out regionally. And we have a, a successful uh, operation in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, a significant portion of our closings, and we live in the world of closings, so when I was asked for sales and closings, I had to, I had to make sure I understood the question. Um, a significant number of our closings are, are coming from our northern operations. Um, and in light of the information that you heard today, I'm sure you're not surprised. Um, it is a, a, a different market in different parts of the state. Um, as I said, we'll always be dedicated to Tucson and have a corporate presence. We're just simply being very particular about our, our acquisitions and our, our opportunities in Tucson. Jeff? <laughs> I was going to allow Amy to go. Ladies first. OK, first of all, I'm Jeff Grobstein. Uh, quick little history on Meritage. Uh, we started about 32 years ago in Phoenix. We came down to Tucson in 1995 and started our operations here. We didn't become public until 1997. And that's when we became a bub uh, public home builder. Um, kind of uh, getting directly to your question. So 
from 95 till about 2005, 2006 was really our super growth years. We did great. One thing where we get a little bit confused in our numbers, and I've got them straightened out, but out of the Tucson operation, we leverage uh, an active adult business as well. So in 2001, we acquired a tremendous amount of property down in Green Valley, which we still own, which is mothballed. So we have not reactivated about 410 lots down there. But also, we're in Casa Grande and Maricopa and Buckeye. And that we actually leverage our Tucson operations to manage those properties as a separate brand. So I just bring that up. Those numbers outside of Pima County aren't in these numbers. So um, in 2000, our height was 2005. And we really, um, 2005 was good although 2006 was great also, not quite as good as 05. We just didn't realize what was happening. We had enough backlog going into 2006 to still have it be a decent year. So in Pima County, we pulled 1,061 permits for 1,334 closings. Now we were about the third or fourth largest builder. KB was very big at that time. They probably pulled about 14 or 1,500 to just put it in context. In 2011, that was our leanest year in Tucson and anything in Pima County, including some active adult in Green Valley, we did 121 permits and about 130 closings. So we lost a tremendous amount of business. To Julie's point, uh, we managed, we probably had about 120 employees that managed Tucson active adult and Las Vegas, we had about 140 total employees. We, our reduction in force from 2007 to 2009, we went down to 35 people, including sales and field. So, you know, major, major rift. You've heard some of you who I've talked to before, I call it, uh, I, it, I didn't name this, uh, our CEO did, but we just considered 2005 to 2015 the lost decade. So that's what we consider it. So. Um, one other big shout out, and I apologize for taking more time, but I could not agree with Bill, um, Mike, and Bridget, you know, and the council should be super commended. When you get into this report and read the detail of it, it's like no data report that I've seen before, and I read a lot of them. They really peel back the onion. You guys are really going to enjoy the read. I mean, it's really, really good. So thank you. Hi, I'm Amy McReynolds. I'm with KB Home. Um, KB is one of the oldest home builders. We've been around since the 1950s. We came to Tucson in 1998, purchased Estes Homes. Um, in the 2000s, we purchased the assets of New World Homes. And so our height of the market was in 03, and we did almost 1,500 closings that year. Um, our low was in 2013 when we closed 27 houses. And so that's quite the, quite the swing. And you talk about the people, and, and when you're from Tucson and you grow up in Tucson and you've worked with these people and we're a small community, it's a very difficult time. So on the good side and the bright side is that currently we're looking at closing about 140 houses this year, um, back up from our 27 just three years ago. And th there's a lot of people that we're bringing back to the industry and bringing back to the organization. And that's exciting to do. It's much exciting, more exciting to hire people. Um, and give them jobs in an in industry that they love. And so that's very promising. Are, are you under any pressure to accelerate your pipeline? What do you have in your pipeline currently? Um, can you bring us up to date on that, just based on the report we just heard? Julie, you want to start on that? Sure. Um, we have four active communities in Tucson. There's two others in closeout, and we anticipate three new communities um, coming online in 2017, they are smaller um, and more, um, a little more thoughtful in their locations and, and the product that we're providing. We are not an entry level builder. I, I'm going to be honest, we know what we do well and we know what we don't do well and entry level is not our, our market. Um, we respect those who do that, um, but they don't pencil, uh, you know, it just doesn't work. Um, we have, uh, you know, we try to stay true to our culture and our philosophy in home building. And many of you know Chris Kemmerly, 
and he's very adamant about that culture and that philosophy, and it takes um, trade relations, and it takes a commitment to your product to stay true to that. And those things are difficult in these markets. And, and just very quickly, I don't think we quite understand the impact that the trade base has on our ability to produce homes. It is a huge, it's in the report, but it is tremendously important, and we are seeing some significant issues. I mean, we are here in Tucson, we're seeing it in Flagstaff, and it's real. And these folks are not coming back to build homes, they're going into other fields, jobs, and you know that's a whole other issue that needs to be addressed. It's great to get a sale, but if you can't produce the home in a timely manner, you have a problem. So um, in, in the next year, we're looking at, um, we'll have somewhere around four or five co active communities um, in, uh, in Tucson. Uh, we'll probably have, I'm gonna say, five active communities in Flagstaff, one of which will have four different product lines. So um, that's why there's opportunity for us there that's a little different than in Tucson. Um, that's what our future what, what about a directive from your your parent companies <laughs> for the national home builders, <laughs> Jeff uh, and Amy, yeah. in terms of w are they asking you to acquire more inventory? Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I want to I want to answer that more directly, but I did want to mention I didn't. So this year we're going to go ahead and close in Tucson about 190 homes. Okay, for the two th 2016, about 220 in active adult between Casa Grande and, and uh, uh, Maricopa. So we, we get some leverage out of that Tucson office. Um, yeah, the, the, our goal is to be very, um, I think Bridget used the word and Mike in their report and in the discussion today about being very disciplined. You know, I, I think we do. We've got a lot of guardrails that we have to stay within in order for us to get our deals underwritten. And I think I can say this uh, very easily. I'm sure Amy and I are both on the creative path to get deals underwritten. So you've got to be very, very clever. And, you know, you've got to really look for every single dime and uh, dollar to go ahead and show that you're going to create an efficient community because we have hurdles that we have to do we have to build shareholder value but the initiative is to is to grow the company and grow the division and uh, be in the right wheelhouse we are uh, probably a little bit more flexible than maybe KB because we can do what I'd almost call one-off type uh, propositions where we can get into a five or six, seven hundred thousand dollar price range if it makes sense, but they're really hard to do. Uh, just as hard as a entry level community can can be where you're lacking on margins. But yeah, the initiative is to grow market share. I, I don't have much more to add. Um, that's our initiative as well. Um, it came out a little over 18 months ago to really grow, and so we got aggressive in, in putting stuff into our pipeline so that we could be strong for 2017, 2018. I'm already getting anxiety about 2019, especially when you look at the land prices and where it's going and where, where we like to be balanced from a buyer profile perspective and making sure we maintain that balance from now into 2019. And, and managing into that. But yeah, very much we've had the directive to grow. Um, and especially as we've grown in our unit count in Tucson for KB, you get more synergies the, the larger you get. And so there's definitely been a push specifically in Tucson. Thank you. You know, Southern Arizona continues to lag behind in permits. If you look nationally, we're still in the bottom 25 to 50% in terms of recovery. So to get to the number that Ginger and Mike were talking about, the 4,500 to 5,000 permits on the average to get back to some stable uh, number, what do we need to do? Where are those buyers going to come from, um, David? And also, what, what do government leaders, <laughs> David, and also what do business and government leaders need to do to have that positive impact on our community? Um, thank you for that softball. I, I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, I think I think you heard a, a, a lot of good information today, uh, but there are certainly a lot of positives. And, and Ginger touched it on, on her last slide and, and, and uh, being hopeful and, and optimistic. And I would say you're seeing an unprecedented level of, of collaboration in terms of the economic development 
um, leaders in this community and trying to work together to create jobs to make Tucson an attractive place to, to growth and uh, to grow and to build. And I think as a community, we need to adapt a posture of being pro-growth. We need to embrace growth. We can't shun it, can't, can't uh, uh, talk bad about it the way that we've done so many times in this community. And I do think there's an obligation from both the, you know, the builder and the municipality to set expectations, to make sure that there's a regulatory process that's consistent, uh, that's, that's expedient, but it's much bigger than that. And I think everybody in this room, including uh, you know, those in government, need to come together to help support growth in whatever way possible. Um, I can tell you that there still is a very active, um, uh, a small but very vocal no growth faction in this community that continues to get involved in issues. But I think together as a community, we've come together in recent years to, to try and overcome that. I can tell you I've been particularly involved in efforts to, to pr uh, protect and expand davis Monthan Air Force Base. And that's one where you hear a lot of people who complain about the noise, who complain about the impact, but there have been community leaders, a lot of people in this, in this room and, and in government who stepped up to say, you know, we need to, to protect DM. More missions at DM means more growth, which means more, which mean more home sales. So I think that's positive and we all have a role to play in that. I can tell you that one of the things right now that's going on, um, jurisdictions across the country are updating their sign codes in the wake of uh, Reed versus Gilbert, which is a Supreme Court case. There's an opportunity in Tucson to streamline and, and make the sign code more business friendly. We continue to hear about national retail chains that have a tough time getting permit, uh, signs permitted here where they get them everywhere else ar around the country. And so we're sending signals to these large companies that it's difficult to do business. Um, I was at a meeting yesterday where um, I got an update about that process and there are individuals who've been on the sign code for 30 years, 30 years in Tucson who are opposing any changes to improve that sign code. We need to do things like improve the sign code to create a better business environment to attract, to attract growth. But that's not just gonna be the, the business community and the elected leaders, because I think they're there. They wanna improve the process. Um, it's gonna require all of us to provide cover and provide support. So I do think it's just developing that pro-growth posture and doing whatever we can collectively to try and bring more people here. Thanks, David. Bob, over there on the end, we're gonna wake you up. Um, mm -hmm. I know you have three master plan communities, La Estancia, Sycamore Canyon, and Sendario Pass. You know, margins are very thin on both sides right now, on the lot development side as well as the home building side. Um, what, what does it take to get deals done with builders? And I know you're trying to do some deals right now. I guess the answer would be I don't know. <laughs> because we're having a lot of trouble making any deals with builders. and. I think uh, we made a deal with Jeff, and I think he's done well out at La Estancia, and I joked that that was a, you know, zero down and a dollar a month for a while, and that's kind of almost what it was. I assure you it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Put it this way. It, <clears throat> it was not the typical deal that you would see where you buy uh, P&E lots for $30,000 a piece up front, and then you spend millions of dollars uh, developing the property. And I think it goes back to what, you know, uh, what we've talked about is the national builders are controlling 92% of the market and their hurdles make it very hard to uh, make any deals work. So we try to be creative. We've been creative once. I don't know that we'll ever be that creative again. <laughs> so it's tough. Thanks. Just to know, we're going to invite Ginger back up here in a minute and Mike also. So if you had questions for them, you'll be able to address those questions as well as to the, to the panel members. Any other thoughts from any of you all where the 4,500 buyers are going to come from? You know, I know there was a lot of discussion in terms of job related. Uh, what about just people moving to our community? Those numbers have been pretty flat or negative for a while. What, what's going to, is that a big impetus for you all in terms of getting people back into the community? I'd, I'd like to, to speak up here just to share with you, I had the benefit of attending the 41st Annual Economic Outlook um, in Flagstaff last week, <clears throat> and the timing was perfect. 
Um, it was, it's a annual event that's held by NAU. Uh, there's about 500 folks who attend. Um, it's hosted and presented by three economists. Um, Dr. Ronald Gunderson was, is a professor of economics at NAU. Dr. Dennis Foster, also a professor of economics. And then Elliot Pollack, um, the CEO of Elliot Pollack um, and Company out of Scottsdale, also an economist. Um, it's always a fascinating look at um, not only Arizona, but the national trends and the national markets. And it was especially interesting, and I'm not going to get political, but because it happened and it was held Thursday of last week. So they joked that they were up late the night before, frantically changing their projections and their predictions um, because there was a significant change in what was anticipated, the outlook. Um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, what they shared was that consumer confidence does continue to grow right now, very slowly and cautiously. Um, that interest rates, their prediction was interest rates would rise, but very slowly. The next six, to, six months to a year, nothing significant. Um, they said they feel that the Fed thinks there's probably about a 10% chance of recession, which is historically proven to be low. Um, the hindrances to economic growth that they shared um, were unemployment, population growth, negative equity, foreclosures, and millennials. And the, the, the most fascinating fact that I took out of the conversation was that these millennials have tremendous, some of them have tremendous loan um, responsibilities, just tremendous. And um, there was a survey by the National Association of Realtors in 2015, and f they asked, what's the biggest inhibitor to you buying a home? Different uh, population segments. And the millennials, 53% said that it was their student loans. Their student loans are tremendous. They stayed in school longer. They got you know, uh, degrees that were beyond the, the, the regular four-year degree. Um, so that's a hindrance. They can't come up with deposits and down payments. Um, it's an issue that has to be addressed. And, and also um, you know, some, some opportunities for long-term growth. It wasn't all negative. Actually, surprisingly enough, they were fairly positive um, on a national level in terms of some changes that may be coming, we don't know, um, in terms of regulation changes, uh, some banking regulation changes, um, lower taxes possibly. Um, and uh, you know, their, their concern was international trade, that we not do anything rash and become too isolationist in international trade. And I think we see it in our market and, and in our business tremendously, the impact um, in, in trade contractors. We lost a lot of, of support in you know, masonry, stucco, et cetera, and we have to be very careful about um, immigration policy. Jeff or Amy, anything to add to that? So the only thing is, as you said, our, our migration's kind of flat, and that needs to be positive again. And I think Ginger, one of her last presentations, maybe it was a year ago, in the charts, when you look at the, the permits compared to the resells, the migration was on there also. And so it's necessary for people to continue to move here, and more people move here than leave here. And so as that becomes more positive, I think that helps in our projections of the 4,000 to 4,500 permits a year. And what has happened in our job growth over the last 12 months is huge in helping that. Right? More people are going to migrate to Tucson because of the jobs that are here. So we're getting a fundamental, stable base by having the jobs. And at the end of the day, it's still a great place to live, and you can't ignore the active adult that wants to move and retire here um, to help with that number as well. Do I have time to? You got 15 seconds. That's not very much time, because I got a lot to say about this one. No, anyhow, to answer your question directly, I think Julie and, and Amy are right on point. I do want to address the millennial factor, um, because we, we were uh, privileged to be part of an Eller uh, group last year. We sat on a panel. Dr. Bond, uh, we, we, Meritage was able to underwrite a uh, kind of a study with his finance class. I think it's 401 or something like that. But anyhow, what we've learned and found out firsthand by talking to a lot of millennials and a lot of people, these students went out and talked to a lot of millennials, is that 
Uh, they do have a tremendous amount of debt, and their priority is in home ownership at the beginning of their millennial cycle. They all agree that they want to have home ownership, you know, but it's in their latter parts. They all want to settle down, but until those later years, they want to be more transient. They want to be able to take opportunities. They want to do the downtown lifestyle, the urban thing, and all that. But at the end of the day, so we believe that that cycle, as these millennials kind of push through, they will ultimately be buying homes. So it's exciting. The 4,500 jobs, I think it's just really uh, about job growth. It's about bringing people here. And I do think they'll come because we're going to see more pressure on the California kind of what I call the California equation, the unaffordability of that. And I think people will migrate to Arizona because it is a great place. I think there'll be people that'll kind of show up in Phoenix and say, hey, this isn't really for me, four and a half million people. I like the lifestyle down here. And we'll see some more commuting maybe, things like that as the Southeast Valley grows for really good jobs. People will make a commute. Somebody from in LA might drive an hour, hour and a half today well, you know, if they live in North Marana and they got to go to Chandler, I mean, my goodness, it's 60 minutes. So I think we'll see a little bit of that, too, and I'm hopeful that we do see that migration. So that's just my two cents. Thank you. Just, just one other question, then we're going to open it up. You know, what's on the horizon for home building uh, in terms of um, modular construction, component parts, panelization, uh, are you seeing anything? I know that recently I've read some stuff about KB, Amy. Can you comment on what you might be doing on a modular basis? Sure. Some of that is, is more national and hasn't, hasn't reached from a local basis um, yet. But as you look at the labor that has come up a couple of times and you look at just even the average age of a framer and trying to get new people in from a, from a framing perspective in general, um, more of that's going to have to be uh, modularized because you can hire people without that skill level that are building your houses today on site. They can go in a, in a factory-like setting and build your prefab your walls and prefab your trusses and, and get all of that um, ready to go on a, on a basis as we're looking at the labor pool shrinking and how do we get more people to choose that as a, as a job. And so um, locally, KB is not doing um, quite that yet. But from, a, from an overall perspective of getting more kids to choose construction as an industry, um, we're doing a lot from a, from a Saba perspective. So just one other thing. I, David sent me a, a link to a video. You know, I always think of 3D printers, and I'm thinking of printing like you'd see in a shop. But in, and I'm not sure if it was in China, he sent us a, a video of a 3D printing, which is a huge machine that extracted concrete, built a house in 100 hours by doing this, and it just followed this linear path. I don't know how long it took for them to put the machine together or how much they invested in that, but that's something that down the road. Also on that same link, and he probably didn't know this, in China they built a 30-story building out of component parts in 15 days. So I think the whole industry is, you know, it, stuff's going to happen, but Ginger and Mike, are you still here? Mm -hmm. Oh, there she is. Do you want to join us and respond to any questions that the audience might have? If you have any questions, raise your hand. We'll take them now. In the back. Tucson loses about 1,000 to 1,500 homes a year anyway, for a wide range of reasons. Do your numbers include that replacement rate? I'm not sure that we're actually replacing, replacing those. Um, that comes from, I see, the U of A table. That's, that would be the question you asked. <laughs> um, I, I did not think through that, I will be honest with you. How much difference would it make of a one-point increase in mortgage rates on your numbers? I think that we still have a lot of room in in financing terms. There's a whole section in the study about financing, and I think what will happen is that the terms will loosen to compensate for that. But when you look back over time, at, at, um, to, in 2005, when we permitted you know, 12,000 homes, interest rates were 6.5%. So the relationship between interest rates and financing terms is critical, and I think we have movement in, on the term side 
uh, that, that, that there was such a backlash in terms that there is still some movement for terms to compensate for a 1% increase or what, whatever it might be. Any of the panel members have any comment on that? The, the only thing I'll add is as you look at the price of land and the price of homes, so not only do you look at a 1% increase op possibility of the interest rate, but home prices continue to go up even if they're priced at where they are today, 179.9, and the pricing continues to go up because of pressure from corporate or pressure from margins or pressure because of what you're paying for land. That combined with the interest rate will knock more people out. So you're looking at about $125 a month and the rent is, and, and the uh, pr mortgage payment is still less than um, one of Roger Carver's units. <laughs> <laughs> but not yours. So these new jobs with great yeah, and whatever, is there any kind of multiplier that you know, uh, filters to the uh, two sides? So what's commonly used in housing forecasting is we want to use household formation, but household formation numbers are, are hard to get at. And so when we use job growth, we say that for every one, one, there's 1 1.2 jobs per household, and each household needs somewhere to live. So that's kind of the, the factor that is commonly used in, in deciding how, many, how much demand is generated by, by new jobs. It's kind of that relationship to households and new household formation. And that's what I used in extrapolating demand. And in Phoenix, is about 1.3. And the reason it's lower than other markets where, where, it's, where it's about 2.0 is because of the active adult communities. You know, one of the things that from our lips to, I think, our political leaders' ears needs to be said loudly and strongly, the whole building industry in our valley has been the manufacturing job of choice of our people. It has been the job that has brought more uh, middle class work, more people, as we would see in, for example, if you go to the, you know, where we've lost our manufacturing jobs, where they had a job where they went into a, a factory. That's even being shown more by the modularization of our, our uh, industry. So I think we should be very proud of it. I think we should talk to it. 30 years ago, we lost our way. And now we're, you know, working our way back from being a poor community to being a prosperous community. This is one of the items that we really need to emphasize to our leadership so they know these jobs are the jobs of the middle class. Thank you. Just one other quick question while we're transitioning here is how is social media affecting your all sales? Jeff, do you have a Twitter account? Yeah, I, I do not have a Twitter account. I do have a Facebook account. I'm not active on it, but I scoop people. Um, so that's my, the, uh, the extent of mine. But I think it's a huge, huge factor right now. I mean, it's a good way to get the message out. Uh, along with social media comes the great things that you can do, but also you get a lot of candid feedback, and you have to be able to manage to that candid feedback. And so it's, it's a good way to communicate with, with your audience, a good way to keep up with what's happening. But uh, I... I I think it's just the way of the future. We just see it, whether it's digital marketing or, you know, online buying, purchasing, things like that. We're just, uh, we got to get with it. Well, I can tell you those Meritage ads follow me all over the internet. I'm, I, I now know that's called a cookie. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, panelists, thanks for taking your time. Great job. Thank you.